So, uh, <laughs> my name is David Tallman. I'm in the Natural Sciences Biology and Biology program. And the idea behind this talk series is just to give everybody exposure to some of the research that people at UAS are doing. Everybody's busy, uh, and a lot of us do research, and a lot of us don't have a chance to explain what we do. And uh, I think people are generally curious about all the things that go on here, which they're just unaware. And so uh, the idea behind this, I think it's Tom's idea, is just to have a, a brief informal gathering where folks can talk about their work really quickly and then have a chance to discuss it informally with others because people always have good ideas and are interested in collaborations and they hear about the work that's going on. And so we've had two people uh, who volunteered to speak at this gathering, Lisa Hoferkamp, who is a chemist here on the UAS Juno campus, and Conrad Meister, who is a new biochemist here on the UAS Juno campus. Okay, cool, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce first Lisa Hoferkamp, who, as I mentioned, is a chemist here at UAS and has been here for coming up on 20 years. Mm -hmm. 20 years, and she does a lot of work on metals and organic contaminants and has for a really long time. So Lisa, you wanna? So as mentioned, I'm uh, Lisa Hoferkamp. I'm a natural science faculty and I do chemistry. I'm an environmental chemist, uh, I guess, in organic chemistry by, by title. <laughs> I was gonna say by trade, but I haven't really done that. Okay, so <clears throat> I, uh, I talk. So we've all indulged in this. Uh, sitting in the hotel, right? Eating microwave popcorn, I'm sure. Perhaps on the way to uh, work, you pick up uh, one of these coffees or one of those things and the you know, egg McMuffin, whatever thing. And of course there's America's pre, uh, dis, uh, predisposition towards pizza. And I, and I'm sure many of us here have some non-stick cookware at home, living in Juneau. Of course, we all take advantage of uh, water resistant or waterproof clothing. And perhaps, oh, you can't see that, can you? That's a bottle of Scotch Guard. Sure, we've all maybe applied some of this to our carpet, right? In hopes that when this happens, it looks more like that rather than what it usually looks like. <laughs> and in the lab, here's some more, con these are a little bit more. Uh, a little bit more complex. These are lubricating uh, fluids that I use in pumps at the lab. And we've all taken advantage of air flight. So all of these examples in one way or another utilize one or more compounds from a group of compounds referred to as PER and polyfluoroalkyl substances or PFAS for short. And all of these are contributing to the presence of PFAS in our air, water, soil and biota. The largest contributor uh, to environmental loads of PFAS comes from this, uh, aqueous film forming foams used in firefighting. The uh, indiscriminate use of products containing these aqueous film forming foams has led to widespread contamination of water sources across the country. In Alaska alone, there have been reports of PFAS in drinking water sources from Fairbanks, North Pole, Moose Creek, Utkiagvik, formerly known as Barrow, Gustavus, Dillingham, King Salmon, Shemya, and Yakutat. So PFAS, these compounds have been found to bioaccumulate. They're toxic. They're capable of moving freely through the environment, and they're very persistent. In fact, you might have heard them referred to as uh, forever chemicals. So I'm going to talk to you today about PFAS contamination of, where, of uh, air, water, soil, and biota. Okay, so although there are hundreds of individual perfluorinated alkyl substances or PFAS compounds, the most commonly uh, encountered in environmental media are perfluorooctane sulfonic acid, uh, for, known as PFOS, and so what I'm showing you here is the uh, chemical structure. The, the intersections represent carbon atoms. Here's a ball and stick model. The gray balls are carbon, the green are fluorine, 
Got a little sulfur, wish I could show you that, a little sulfur there, that's that yellow one with three oxygens attached to it. This PFOS, perfluorinated octane sulfonic acid. Another common, very common PFAS is uh, perfluorooctanoic acid. Again, you've got the long carbon backbone, fluorine, the fluorine's here a little lighter green, and now the difference is instead of a sulfur there, you've got a carbon atom with two oxygens and a hydrogen, that's your your PFO or perfluorooctanoic acid. So these two PFAS have been the focus of the majority of health impact investigations. And they're, they're pretty good representatives of the general class of compounds. PFAS. Each one of them, okay, each one of them shows a long hydrophobic or fat-loving tail. That's that long carbon backbone. You can see it in both of them, and uh, a hydrophilic or water-loving head. So they're a lot like soap, but uh, not like the soap that Granny used to make by the pool, <laughs> right? Here's a here's a molecule of typical soap, right? Showing that long hydrocarbon, hydrophobic tail, and the hydrophilic head. But you notice the difference there. You see a lot of hydrogen atoms. Rather than hydrogen atoms, the PFAS have fluorine atoms. Okay. And this, uh, this is the feature that provides them with unique surfactant properties. It makes them repel both water and oil, and it renders them uh, resistant to combustion. Another way to put that is makes them flame resistant. Okay. But it also renders them toxic. So both these PFAS compounds that I've shown you, PFOA and PFOS, and uh, several others, okay, the way that they differ is in the length of that carbon backbone chain, okay, have, uh, have been linked to low birth weight babies, elevated cholesterol levels, and certain cancers in humans. Uh, there's a whole host of maladies that these compounds have been linked to in, in lab animals. I'm going to tell you about a project that I'm doing. Okay, I'll describe briefly one of the projects in my lab that I've been working on that investigates PFAS contamination <laughs> at a site in Ukiagvik, formerly known as Barrow. Okay, but first I'll give you some background. Okay, so from 1947 to 1966, Utkiavik was the site of the Naval Arctic Research Laboratory, or NARL. This is a it's a photo, the archive. Until the early 80s, the Navy continued to use the site for firefighting exercises and various other military things that military people do. Okay. Uh, the site is now occupied by the Ilisagvik Tribal College. In 2017, okay, the Navy measured PFAS levels in the water from a freshwater lake on the Narl site in Mikpuk Lake. You see this labeled right there. Okay. And they found PFOS, the octanoic sulfonate, and PFOA, the octanoic carboxylate. They found levels above and very near the EPA's lifetime advisory limit. And okay. you can see, um, I can't really show you, right underneath, underneath Navy hangar. Okay, there's a site there, and you can see the PFOA levels are right around 80 and the PFOS are at 87. And then you've got some other in the, on the other side, got them up around 100. Those are part per trillion levels, okay? So the Navy finds these are above the lifetime, uh, the EPA's lifetime advisory limit, which is 70 parts per trillion. So the, uh, the Navy post signs, they, they discourage fishing in the lake. And they also sent out a, an advisory to residents to not fish in the lake. In fact, this lake was at one time used as a secondary water source for the Ogbit. That was certainly discouraged. So in the summer of 2018, the North Slope Borough of Wildlife Management contacted me and asked if I would like to help with a project initiated by residents wanting more information, especially about PFAS levels in fish from the lake and then likely uh, wildlife in the wildlife that consume those fish. 
So since then, I've been working with the Inupiaq community of the Arctic Slope, the North Slope Borough Department of Wildlife, the US EPA, and UAS Environmental Science undergraduate, Sarah Novell Lane. She's right here. She's actually doing heavy lifting here. Okay. And we've been measuring PFAS levels in sediments and fish from Lake Imikbuk. Okay, so uh, let's see. In October 2018, we collected sediment from one of the sites where Narl tested water and fish from the lake. And that's right here, it's that one I originally pointed to that had about 80 parts per trillion uh, PFOA and 80 eight parts per trillion PFOS, <coughs> okay? So uh, let's see, we've already found levels of PFOS and PFOA in the sediments at that one site that are higher, right, uh, than those, than the results from uh, the, from what the Navy in the, found in the lake water. Right, you can see our site, this is, this, well, can't really, these are all average, the, the line second up from the bottom is PFOA and PFOS levels, the second and fourth columns that we found there. You can see we found 113 plus or minus 52 parts per trillion PFOA and 731 plus or minus about 200 of PFOS in the sediment. All right, so compare that to the 80 parts per trillion in the water. I think we're having some some results there, right? We also measured a shorter chain carboxylate and sulfonate, and those levels are, are not quite as overwhelming, but they're still worrisome. Okay, so um, let's see. In the future, we have extensive uh, uh, sampling planned for this coming, in fact, it's for this coming summer. And the results from those efforts will help us to understand how pre-existing PFAS compounds, in other words, those deposited in the sediment, how they move through the uh, and transform within the Arctic environment, and uh, how the original PFAS and their degradation products travel up the food chain, as well as what new PFAS contributions we can expect to arrive here from other parts of the world. In other words, long range atmospheric transport, that's becoming more and more obvious as more studies on snowpacks are completed. So I'll end with this image of a lotus leaf, the chemical properties of the lotus leaf that repel water from its surface. They're analogous to the chemical properties that allow PFAS to repel water from the surfaces with which it interacts, All right? But unlike the uh, chemical uh, substances that give the lotus leaf, its properties. PFAS are not harmless themselves and they don't readily fall apart to harmless compounds. So these PFAS are a class of contaminants that we need to pay attention to now so that we don't have to worry about them in the future. And I'm happy to answer any question. Just got a, a follow-up. I think you did, uh, I think we, they found PFAS over by the fire training center here in June. We're all surprised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the, I think Gustavus, but they, here I think the, the result was that because there is already piped water, they're not going to do anything about it. But I'm curious about whether or not it's uh, close enough to any um, fisheries or bird or anything that might be problematic. Well, I think there used to be a run that came <clears throat> up. Uh, into that area of one of those ephemeral creeks or something. And since they started the, they started crushing gravel there, I think they've, it's not anything that anybody's gonna do anything about anymore. Yeah, the area used to be one of the most productive coho sites in Southeast Alaska, but there's been changes in hydrology as well as just human built environment that have reduced that over time. And I don't know right now how much salmon there is. I think another interesting place would be the, um, the airport. All right, especially those uh, lagoons, those ponds that they land the planes. I have a feeling those the are probably jam packed. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. that's right there by the wetlands. So anything that's the runoff from there would go right into the wetlands. It's true, but they've already shown like pretty much anybody here. We could put you in a blender and find PFAS in your blood. <laughs> so. Yes. Um, I was late, so if you already talked about it, I'm sorry. But um, did you talk about remediation at all? 
Remediation. Well, because they you know, it's not like it would be hard to remediate since they're remediation. These are hard compounds to remediate. Really, the, I've read a few papers, uh, and it seems like the most efficient way is to when it's in soil mm -hmm. is to burn it. So thermal uh, degradation, and you have to capture the little devils too as they come off the soil because they do have a strong tendency towards long range atmospheric transport. So it's a it's a complicated process. And I said in that last slide that one of the things we want to look at is how they change as they move through the environment. Problem is they don't change very much. So that should be a rather short lived <laughs> experiment. <laughs> but maybe we'll find something, right? Maybe in the Arctic where the the UV, the short uh, wavelength radiation flux is pretty high. Maybe you got there's enough energy to zap them into something else. So did I understand that one of the way uh, you were talking about uh, fire um, Fighting foams. Fighting foams, yeah. Mm -hmm. So is there kind of a, is the industry trying to create different foams that will be less toxic? Well, yeah, they are. They're trying to, the industry is pushing, moving towards using, as opposed to the octanoic, the C8 backbone, they're using similar compounds that just have shorter chains, which uh, that makes them more susceptible to degradation, but not by much. Mm -hmm but it also renders them more uh, soluble in water. So that becomes really interesting. It's, it's kind of an interesting, yeah, <laughs> take on everything. Yeah. How, uh, how hard or expensive is it to quantify PFAS from a fish sample versus a sediment sample? Well, I think the, the biggest challenge, I'll let Sarah back um, me up on this. Uh, well, actually, we're using um, pretty much the same process of extraction in both the fish tissue and the sediment. Um, our problem is uh, the equipment that we have available in our lab is the GCMS, and we're having problems quantifying it on GCMS because PFAS usually um, are run on liquid chromatography. Uh, so that is one of the bigger problems that we're facing. We're trying to come up with a way to detect it on our GCMS because we have to derivatize the chemicals. It's, it's like an extra step in the process. Um, but uh, fortunately, we're uh, working with the EPA. I can say that, all right, the EPA, <laughs> um, that they're able to run our samples for us to get their LCMS. Yeah. What, is that? what do they charge for a sample? Just curious. Uh, I can't say right now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll probably know soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> but you know why? Like a, they, you can't run them on a GC because they're charged, and you have to have a neutral. They're they're one's a sulfonate, one's a carboxylate, so they get stuck on the column. So Sarah wants to derivatize them and just basically, you know, make them some complex that's sufficiently stable that it that it's neutral and it can run on the column, but. And then another big problem is cross-contamination because they are everywhere. Yeah. And then once you start working with them, right, and we have our standards, which are super high concentrations, then the lab becomes problematic. Mm -hmm. so, and they stick to the glass. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so not only do you have to worry about cross-contamination, but you have to worry about analyte loss because they're so, it's not weird. They're like unsticky is their characteristic but they stick to the glass. <laughs> yes? Is this kind of a, is it a state problem? Is it a national problem? What are others doing? I think it's a national, it? I think it's not only a national problem. I mean, they find them in every country in the world. So are we doing some kind of or groundbreaking science or experiments? Are we learning from others or where are we at as far as the status with the, the research? Has it been published or you guys? Oh, has, am I doing any groundbreaking? Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cutting edge, man. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm just looking at, I'm quantifying PFAS in the sediments and the biota for those people, for the um, Inupiaq community in, in Barrow, in Upiagvik, right. because they want to know. Right. As far as remediation goes, I think that's when the EPA starts to step in. And I think that's why they're interested in helping us because they want to know what their liability is. Right. But the problem, I mean, remediating sediment, you can dig up the sediment, put it in an incinerator. Right. But the water, that's a little bit more challenging. Yeah. 
So is that new? I guess that's what I'm getting at. Is this new research? or is uh, there PFAS have things? been around since about the late 60s, I think, is when they really started using them. So that's why they're everywhere, because everybody likes them. I mean, it's yeah. kind of like carbon dioxide. You but know? the yeah. extent of the problem seems to be newer. And it seems like that's what the focus is on right now for researchers, is to find the, the extent of the problem, like the fate and the transport of the chemicals, sure. before um, they really start working on remediation. So DEC did a little bit of a study in Fairbanks. I don't know what the results were, but they did an incineration study to find out what the results would be. Um, I don't know if that was quantified as research, but it was supported, I, I think, by the EPA. And so that was last results. winter. I, I called them and <laughs> I haven't heard back. It's very hush hush about that incineration. So, so yeah, so, and then I, I was worried, I guess, about you incinerated, how do you capture the stuff going out the stack? It's an expensive today. process. Yeah, so the, and, and the only way you're going to get it out of water is to filter it, I think. And it's become a bigger problem because they had stockpiles of, of the aqueous firefighting foam in all of these airports. And the airports, or DOT actually in our case, started giving and selling it to local municipalities because plan. they had excess. And that's what happened to Gustavus. They gave them a whole tank of it. And uh, Gustavus used it for a little bit of uh, uh, firefighting uh, practice and then put out one brush fire with it. And then they've been dealing Well, the first step is awareness, right? And I think the people are really making a good, um, like citizens, there's a group up in uh, Anchorage, a citizens group that's really going hard on making studies and holding uh, monthly uh, comp well, meetings where they talk about the problem and, and research that needs to be done. Do you ever look at um, where you find it was pretty, with a very high concentration? Are there certain bacteria? Bacteria in, that might yeah, be able yeah. to chew on them? Yeah. Mm. So people have a look. I don't, no, I don't think people. I haven't seen any papers on that yet. Like I said, they're. I, Sarah made a good point. They're really just finding them right now. Yeah. yeah. Quantifying. Them. And the other thing is, so since they, like, they're so hydrophobic in nature, will it work when you clean up some of the oil spills? You get something which attracts them. Could you put that out of the? Look at that. Yeah, and a hidden advantage to an oil spill. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the other way, could you use some of the stuff that you use to clean oil, oh, which is also hydrophobic mm -hmm. compounds, mm -hmm. to use to clean up the peef? Because they should be. I well, always have an issue with that. I mean, it's like it's like going from the like frying the pan into the, the fire. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. A little pun there, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's a non-stick frying pan. The fire is put out with chemicals. I think it's maybe, a good point. Maybe we can uh, take about like a five minute break and then. Uh, cool. Thank you. Can we Our second speaker today, as I mentioned before, is Conrad Meester, who comes to us from uh, prestigious Max Planck Institute in Germany. And Lisa's been here for 20 years. Conrad's been here for 20 days. <laughs> we're really glad to have him as well. So, Conrad, you want to talk about some of your research on yeah. antifreeze proteins? Yeah, thank you and uh, welcome everyone to this talk. It's still a kind of unique setting to talk in the video. <laughs> um, yeah, so I want to talk about uh, antifreeze proteins or really cool molecules, how I like to call them. And I want to tell you about what I find fascinating about this stuff, what I plan to do here, what we did in the past, and why we should actually study this. And that also gives you an idea why am I here, because since my grad student's day, I've been fascinated by the questions of how do some animals, like how are they able to survive in the cold? How do they deal with the cold or with freezing or ice and these conditions? And we know, for instance, that seals or penguins, they're pretty chubby uh, animals. So they have a lot of fat which insulates them. But then you have fish, you have insects, you have some of the plants that can also survive uh, in the cold or in icy conditions. And they don't have a lot of fat, right? If we look at some of these wokiwinkies, what you see, and those are from Antarctica, or uh, this insect, they clearly don't have a big fat layer. So the question is, how do they survive? How can they deal with ice in their environments? And I've been doing research on that topic mostly in the Antarctic, and um, mostly looking at the fish down there and how they do it. And we know from these organisms since the 60s, that they contain special molecules in their blood. So they have a natural antifreeze 
in their own blood. Uh, and those are biomolecules, uh, so specific proteins, and they've been first termed antifreeze proteins, and so we stuck with that name. And these antifreeze proteins basically enable those kind of organisms, um, which we also call freeze-avoiding organisms, because they do not want to have any ice in their blood or whatsoever. Um, while you have other organisms that actually like to be frozen, uh, you probably know some of those famous examples where you put the wood frog in a freezer, it comes back alive, or some of the insects do as well. So these are actually freeze-tolerant organisms. Uh, but I'm going to talk about the freeze-avoiding organisms and how they survive in icy environments. Oh. Oh. So. <laughs> you put frogs in freezers. <laughs> yeah, too, I guess. <laughs> so I don't know where I'm supposed to click on yeah, yeah. oh, okay. yeah, And these antifreeze proteins have now been found in a lot of different organisms. And what you see there are basically structures of different organisms, uh, of different proteins found from different <coughs> organisms. So you find them in some of bacteria and fungi and plants and also in fish. And what you can see is they look very, very different. <laughs> right? So almost, if I would compare them to fruits, this AFP1, which is this simple helix, basically would be a banana. The random coil AFGPs would be something like grapes. Right? So you really have structurally very, very diverse proteins. And that's very interesting because it means nature came up with different ways to solve the same problem, right? Which is this preventing from freezing or this growth from ice. And it's just a bigger structure. But if you look closer, you actually find that they do have some things in common and they all have one specific site that binds to the ice. And we call that the ice binding site. And similar to what Lisa just explained, this is usually rather hydrophobic. Huh? And what we also learned about these antifreeze proteins is that they have a non-colligative mechanism. That means it's not what we do when we want to cool, for example, the liquid in our car. We have a lot of antifreeze in it, and it just shifts the overall freezing point, right? But it would also then have an effect on the melting points and colligative effect. But the antifreeze proteins actually work by a mechanism that's a non-colligative effect. Yeah? And I think this becomes always so super nicely visible in this example is I'm going to show you, which is basically an optical microscopy experiment that we do in the lab. And that um, gives us ideas on how well an antifreeze protein works. So what you see is on the left side, you have a solution. There's no antifreeze protein present. On the right side, you have antifreeze protein present. And basically what happens, we lower the temperature. On the left side, you see the ice crystal keeps growing in the circular disk shape. And on the other side, the, in the presence of the antifreeze proteins, the ice crystal A took a very unique shape. It's now a bipyramidal crystal. And B, it stops growing. Huh? I lower the temperature and nothing happens. And that's basically what I just told you. It's a non-colligative effect because, of course, it wouldn't go the other way. Right? If it melts, it melts. And this effect is, is super interesting, of course, because it means the antifreeze proteins are directly interacting with ice. So they have the capability of binding to the ice. And not only that, but they can also stop the ice. And this is, of course, something, this is a property that's super interesting for a lot of application. And the majority of the applications, we look, talk about them as the big four, is in food science, where, for instance, Unilever already uses them in ice cream. Mm -hmm. I probably know the example. If you buy this big family package of ice cream, first time you eat it, it's a nice and creamy and soft. You put it back into the freezer, you take it out, there's a lot of tiny ice crystals on it, it doesn't taste anymore. It's because of a process called recrystallization, and you have more ice crystals forming above a certain ties, it affects the texture, and it then affects our taste sense. And I found it super interesting that someone told me here that apparently you can freeze some forms of salmons, or you can the king crab, if you freeze it, it doesn't taste anymore, while a smaller crab works. So that's kind of interesting because I think it's probably also to do with how much water content some of those organisms have. I think that's something I want to <laughs> look at at some point. But anyway, so what I was going to tell you is that the, uh, the uh, Unilever, the company, uses them in ice cream to prevent this. Because, again, the antifreeze proteins can bind to the ice and they prevent the process of this regrowing to bigger sized crystals. Uh, of course, antifreeze is a term we know that we shouldn't drink. <laughs> and has a negative impact, so they we coined or rephrased the name, and they're called ice structuring proteins in the ingredients. So if you ever look at ice cream, you might find them. 
Then, of course, the same exact same mechanism applies to medical applications where if we want to store blood, we all know there's always an organ shortage because we can't freeze them. Huh? So it's the same thing. If you, if you would get ice crystals growing, there's a big problem because it would destroy the cells. It wouldn't just destroy the taste, it would destroy the cells. Huh? Then a big thing, what I'm also working with is a so-called inhibition of gas hydrates. Gas hydrates um, are ice-like structure combats. You can see it in the image. It almost looks like ice, this white structure. And it forms in the pipelines and uh, under certain temperature and uh, pressure conditions. And it's basically also just water and, and they form cages where you have some of the hydrocarbons basically locked inside of it. And interestingly, those antifreeze proteins can also stop the growth of the gas hydrates which of course is also very interesting um, for certain applications. And the last one is the whole thing about ice repelling surfaces, um, because you know that, for example, if we go to an airport, if they stop in order to get all the ice off the wings, they usually spray them with something like ethanol, or, uh, and that's, those are huge costs so in order to make those better. Um, copying some of the ideas from nature on how to basically bind to ice or inhibit these ice cores is a big market. Like your friend sent it, because I've been working with Unilever for quite some time, said that they actually estimated this whole antifreeze protein market is going to grow by 5 million. So that's a big thing. This is nothing I'm <laughs> particularly involved with, but I just think this is, means it's something worth to further investigate. So what, what do I actually do? What did I do? And what I'm going to do here is, so I'm very interested in how they work. So I'm studying the working mechanisms. And I do it here mostly with optical microscopy techniques. That means I'm looking at how the ice shape uh, changes, then I can measure um, certain activities. Uh, over at Max Planck Institute, we use then a bit more fancy methods as well to really look at the molecular scale, um, how it works. Then what I'm really interested, um, and this is one of the reasons why I did come here, is because here is an environment where you still have so many different organisms that needs to be checked for antifreeze activity and that you can possibly harvest uh, for the compounds and to also understand what is actually the biological uh, relevance to those studies and so i hope to also identify new antifreeze proteins and i'm mostly talking about the antifreeze proteins here but there's also the counterpart the so-called ice nucleating proteins and these you find for instance in bacteria which can be a threat to uh, aquaculture. For example, bacteria, what they do is, oh, there's a plant, you have a bacteria, and it's getting cold, and it basically initiates ice because we know ice can pierce. So it pierces the cell membranes of the plant and then basically sucks out all the nutritious sugar juice. So this is initiated by so-called ice nucleating proteins, which have some structural similarities, but which is an equally interesting topic. And then we also work on applications here. And um, cryopreservation of blood cells is one of the bigger things uh, I'm looking at because a shortage of blood cells uh, is, I think, especially in rural communities like uh, Alaska, is a, is a bigger issue. And then the gas hydrate inhibition. And one particular big thing I've been always working on is, is, is also improving this whole purification scheme. Because the one big reason we don't see the antifreeze proteins in a lot of uh, different applications is still the price. Because, I mean, you have to go either all the way to Alaska or to the Antarctic to actually get enough, let's say, blood to purify them. And those are costly processes, which the, uh, which the industry would need. But by basically optimizing those processes, um, we could really speed that up and bring them into different uh, regions. And one idea I'm taking is basically I use their property to be able to bind to ice. Right? This is very unique for them. And basically make that the property or like this affinity to, to purify it. That means I add a lot of stuff into let's say something which has an ice shell and i know only the antifreeze proteins can bind to the ice everything else usually get expelled from the ice huh? because the ice is rather pure dump out everything what is else and then the afp should be in the shell i melt the whole thing then have a rather pure step which is a would be a unique way of an affinity quantity. <laughs> so now i want to end this talk by <laughs> asking you because um since talking to some um, colleagues here, I've already got a lot of cool and interesting ideas. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm really interesting is this, people told me about some ice worm or glacier worms here, mm -hmm. which of course would be a prime example of an organism that needs a certain kind of antifreeze or maybe recrystallization proteins in order to survive up there. 
or if it's just because it feeds on the algae that basically have antifreeze proteins and this will help them then survive. So if you know where I could find them, <laughs> I'd love to go up there with a student and collect some and try some of the methods. The other one is called hair eyes and I've seen in an older book uh, before I came that it's also been seen here in Juneau or Southeast Alaska which you usually find on rotten trees and it's a hair, it really is a very unique eye structure. It looks like hair and um, it's due to specific fungi that's in the, uh, in the rotten tree stems. Mm -hmm. And I'm very interested in, in, in taking that out, cultivating and, and see what kind of uh, uh, <laughs> molecules that has. And the last thing uh, is more like a, I don't know if it's a vision or it's an idea, but the, what I was thinking is that, okay, it seems to be a lot of fishing going on here and usually the whole, <laughs> the whole fish blood uh, is garbage right because no one uses it and then if it's possible to basically collect all this garbage and purify the protein out of it that would be a pretty good source <laughs> of uh, additional income but that's more like optimizing the method it's more like a bigger vision for the future so i hope i get you a slight bit of idea but what I'm interested in and what it's worth talking to me about. And uh, I think it's 20 days, maybe in a few months, I'll be able to show you some actual results from here and nothing from the past. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we should uh, find out if the folks online have any questions. Hang up. <laughs> no, there's no chat or anything. Or, um... they can unmute it. Yeah, they can unmute it. So. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. So, are the, I, you said they're all natural products? These antifreeze, but no desire to like create a synthetic. Yes, there's, <laughs> and then you want to. There's a huge community that's trying to mimic them. I mean, this whole field of synthetic antifreeze proteins is very big, and there's, I don't know, hundreds of groups worldwide that try to mimic it. What, of course, I didn't go much into detail. So they have different properties. One is this thermolysteresis, then this prevention of ice crystallization. What they, they, they are capable of mimicking one part of the activity, but not another one. For example, we can now make polymers that are able to shape some ice crystals, for example, polyvinyl alcohol is one of them. But to, in order to, the video I just showed you with this, where you really go down and they form a certain crystal and the, the crystal stops growing, none of the synthetic mix um, has that do it. Shows that no, behavior. Oh, that's it's an interesting practice. And the main reason is because we don't know how they work. So we, what I showed you is, is of course, a uh, more macroscopic picture, right? And we need to go really on the molecular scale and see Okay, what are the interaction sites? That's it's one of them. Can you take the natural product and just kind of start tweaking synthetically little portions of it, or just? That's what w we do as well. So you basically chemical modify. So like I said, that's how See we how figured that out. a given property. Yes, that's basically how you figured out which sign binds to the ice, for instance, right? We said, okay, we have those residues here. We're gonna take chemical A that makes this one, destroys this one. See, does it still function? Yes, no. And this way, we we get an idea how it works and. For example, the way it basically works is that these antifreeze proteins, they basically can structure water. So they have specific residues, either sugar groups or OH groups that kind of mimic the ice. And then they structure water. And you can think about it as it basically makes its own ice and brings it to the ice. And then the ices merge. And this and is how it sticks. On that. And that's how it sticks. The pattern. And that's basically huh. why the They're antifreeze bossy. and the ice nucleating are very similar because the antifreeze protein is very tiny and the ice nucleating protein is huge. Mm -hmm. And so the, if you structure enough water, of course, that's how you make ice. Right? You, you create this little, little seed, seed one that basically initiates this ice nucleation process. That for that, you need a certain size. But if you make it very tiny, it's not big enough to make size, but it has the, the, basically the affinity or the structure to bind to ice. And then what happens is if something binds to ice, ice still wants to grow, but it has to grow in a curved form. And that becomes energetically unfavorable to grow in a curved direction. And that's what's uh, eventually stopping the ice curve. Cool. I guess uh, we'll do this again in another month or so. And 
It will not be chemists because we just exhausted our supply. Of <laughs> so I think we're looking for volunteers if anybody wants to talk about their research in March. We have one. Oh, we do in the back, Dan. Oh, okay. But All right, awesome. Uh, you want to give us a preview? <laughs> Wait, before we do that, I'd like to give a comment. Yeah. Cool. We'll have probably two presenters, so we don't know who the other one is for to go with Dan, but uh, probably right after spring break. Mm -hmm. So, What are you going to talk about? What am I going to talk about? Um, well, I'm going to be talking about why, why um, two weeks ago I was completely obsessed with what was happening at uh, on Twitter, which is that the trials of the psychologists who helped um, did the most to help design the torture program at Guantanamo were on trial. And part of the reason why, you know, I was encouraging my students to actually get on Twitter, which is a really, um, believe it or not, it's, the, <laughs> it's got all sorts of problems, but the the transcripts from the uh, from the trial are being redacted, while the live tweeting from from the courtroom was not. Um, so, the, trying to see if we can reconstruct what's um, has been um, redacted from um, the courtroom trials of the of the psychologists. Uh, there. So.